The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Psalm 22, to the chief musician set to the deer of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and am not silent. Now, as we're reading this, think of Christ on the cross. This is anticipating Israel's Messiah. But you are holy enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones, they look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Right out of the book of John, fulfilled in Christ. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he is not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. A posterity shall serve him, it will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. Now, I didn't plan this. We read these Psalms in order. And we've been doing this now for 10 years. And what comes up each week is what comes up. Uh, we're going to be referring to the 22nd Psalm in today's sermon. That was not planned. It just happened to be that way. And uh, I was actually surprised that I got the 22nd Psalm. I need to read you our text verse here. Today is Judges 10. It's verses 1 through 5. Now, I'd like you to think about what's been going on in the book of Judges. I'm not going to repeat all of the detail that has come out, but you remember all of the uh, individual sections that have been arisen. At first, Israel does bad the first chapter and a half or so are telling us of all of the apostasies of Israel, the disasters that's coming upon them. They're turning back to the Lord, him forgiving, and then they turn away from him again. All that was talked about. And then we started to get into the judges themselves. Othniel 
right? Remember that? And his daughter, and she leaps off the donkey, and that was picturing the message of the Messiah going to the Gentiles while Israel had rejected them. And then we got into Ehud, and he was uh, stabbed at Glone, right? Remember that? The law is coming to an end, fulfilled in Christ. And then from there, we had Shamgar, how to obtain the uh, salvation that is provided through Israel's Messiah. And then it went through one judge after another. It's been showing us redemptive history. Deborah, the Word, the New Testament being portrayed right there in the Old Testament scriptures. Chapter 5, the Lord rejoicing over the church, Jew and Gentile merged together because of Deborah and her ministry. And then you get into chapter 6 and Gideon and all of the things that pictured going into the future tribulation period. And as I said, I didn't even know until we were in Judges uh, 6 with Gideon that all of these patterns were there. I was just doing one sermon after another without even paying any attention. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there typing this and I'm saying, now, wait a minute, we've got a logical progression. This wasn't something orchestrated by Charlie Garrett. It's just something that the Word has shown us. What happens and don't answer it, just think about it, what happens after the tribulation period, which is going to come. The Bible says it's coming in both testaments. What happens after the tribulation period? Here we go. Judges 10, 1 through 5, totally surprised at the outcome of the what is pictured in these sermons, but here we go. Judges 10, 1 through 5, this is entitled Tola and Jair, Judges of Israel. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir, in the mountains of Ephraim. He judged Israel 23 years and died and was buried in Shamir. After him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and he judged Israel 22 years. Now he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they also had 30 towns, which are called Havot Jair, to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Kamon. Now, before I get into the sermon today, we have uh, regularly two Hebrew-speaking people in the church. When they're in town, they're usually here, okay? And they are very gracious to my Hebrew because it's self-taught, and so they never say anything. Rhoda did say one time something, which I won't repeat, but it was, <laughs> it was kind of humiliating to me personally. <laughs> but having said that, we now have a third Hebrew-speaking person in the church today. And so when he hears me, he's probably going to be rolling in the aisle laughing, but I can't help that. This sermon was typed on 5 February of 2024. In the NIV Life Application Study Bible that my mother gave me in the year 2001, this note is provided concerning our verses today. In five verses, we read about two men who judged Israel for a total of 45 years Yet all we know about them, besides the length of their rules, is that one had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. What are you doing for God that is worth noting? When your life is over, will people remember more than just what was in your bank account or the number of years you lived? Well, that is why they call it a life application study Bible. It applies the Bible to your life, but not much more. Actually, we know a lot more about these men than the commentary cited. We know that their time of judgeship comes after Abimelech. We know their names and the names of the father and grandfather of one of them. We also know the tribes they're from and where one of them ruled. We also see where the sons of one of them led the towns which they possessed and where those towns were located. If we have read the Bible several times and remember what is in it, we can recall even more things about them as well based on their genealogies and so forth. So, a good life application concerning the NIV's life application comment is that we will get out of the Bible what we are willing to look for. And that not everyone, even a scholar writing a commentary, may have provided the very basics of what is presented. In other words, read your Bible but read it contemplatively and carefully. Consider what is presented and ask questions of the text concerning what you read. Our text verse comes from Psalm 119. It is verse 27. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so shall I meditate on your wonderful works. The idea conveyed by the NIV commentary is partially right. The contents of these five verses are not as detailed as many of the judges' stories we have seen or will see. 
However, by the time we have finished these verses, you will see that there is a great deal we can learn from what is said right here. In fact, even I was surprised at the amount of detail and what it is telling us about the future. The pages of Judges have thus far taken us on a journey through a great deal of redemptive history. We have seen amazing details concerning the history of Israel, which includes our own dispensation and the time just after it, meaning the tribulation period. As clearly as it could be presented, it is right there in the previous Judges sermons. Having evaluated that period in great detail, including a lengthy passage pointing us to the coming of the Antichrist in the person of Abimelech, what is ahead? Will we have new pictures of some other era of Israel's history, or will it continue the narrative that began in Judges 1, moving forward in time beyond the tribulation period? I didn't know as I entered into the verses. I had no idea. But by the time I was through evaluating the mechanics of them, the answer was readily apparent to me. With that said, let us enter into the passage and take a careful look at each verse. From there, we can then discover the typology behind them. After reviewing seemingly innumerable passages since Genesis 1 verse 1, I am fully convinced that typology is the main substance that is to be discovered within the pages of Scripture. And Jesus said it himself, you search the Scriptures that you think you have eternal life, but they are which speak of me. And he says, if you believe Moses, you would believe me because Moses spoke of me, right? Everything about the word is pointing us to the coming of Israel's Messiah. Such great things as this are to be found in God's superior word. And so let us turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I have three separate thoughts for you today. The first is a man of Issachar. It's verses one and two. With Abimelech, my father is king, out of the picture, the narrative turns to two judges whose lives are almost completely overlooked. Of them, like others, Kyle says, of these two judges, no particular deeds are mentioned, and no doubt because they performed none. That's Kyle's commentary on this section. It is a sentiment that fails to understand the purpose of the biblical narrative. As has been seen, even if minimal detail is given, that which is provided is there for a reason, for typology. God is telling us a story and is using only the relevant details to convey that story. These judges may have built great cities like 1 Kings 12, 25, led valiant battles as in Judges 8, 13, married a lot of wives like 2 Samuel 5, 13, and so forth. However, those details in regard to the lives of these men are not relevant to the typology being provided. Everybody see that? Despite this, and with the sparsest details provided, it is possible to glean quite a bit from the minimal descriptions given of them. Verse 1, after Abimelech, there arose to save Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo. The words are unusual. Vayakum achare avimelech lehovoshia et Israel tola ben pua ben dodo. And arises after Abimelech to save Israel tola son pua son dodo. The reason the words are unusual is because they include the name of the grandfather. It is a rare thing and not seen in any other judge's genealogy. The reason for this is probably to avoid confusion concerning the ancestry of these two men. Both Tola and Pua are family names. Having said that, one tradition says that the term Ben Dodo, or son of Dodo, is an appellative, not a name. The word son can mean a designation rather than a literal sonship. That will be explained when the name Dodo is defined. The word used to describe Tola is kum, to arise or stand. We are not told how his judgeship came about or what reason he arose or was raised up. He simply arose to save Israel. Further, it notes that his ascension was after Abimelech. Thus, there was no overlap in their times of judging. But also, Abimelech's time over Israel was one of usurpation, appointing and establishing himself as a sovereign. Think of what's coming in the future, very soon in Israel's future, most likely. This is not the case with Tola. As for the names, Tola and Pua are family names of brothers of the sons of Issachar who were first mentioned in Genesis 46, verse 13. 
There, with a variant spelling of Pua, it says, the sons of Issachar were Tola, Puva, Job, and Shimron. They are again recorded in Numbers 26-23, also with the variant spelling of Pua. The sons of Issachar, according to their families, were of Tola, the family of the Tolaites, of Pua, or Puva, the family of the Punites. That's Numbers 26-23. They are also listed once again in 1 Chronicles 7, verse 1, with the same spelling as in this judge's account. It says there, the sons of Issachar were Tola, Pua, Jashub, and Shimron, four in all. The name Tola is from Tola, a crimson grub worm from which is described the scarlet, meaning the purple colored dye used for the crimson colors of the tabernacle referred to in Exodus. That worm is used to describe the coming Messiah in Psalm 22, believe it or not. But I am a worm, Tola, and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. The name means crimson worm or simply worm. The name Pua may come from one of several roots. If it is from Pe, it means mouth, utterance, lip, and something like that. That's Abarim's evaluation of it. If it comes from the word Po, it may mean here, okay, which the word Po means here. That would be the NASB concordance. Lang describes its root this way. Pua is Chaldi for Rubia Tinctorum, or Matter Red. Thus, it would mean Matter. The name Dodo is from Dod, beloved, love, or uncle. It means something like beloved, his beloved, or loving. Because of the unusual reference to a grandfather, as noted above, some have suggested this name is being used as an appellative. Thus, it would be son of his uncle or cousin. If so, it would be referring to Abimelech mentioned in verse 1. However, Abimelech was from Manasseh, not from Issachar, Thus, this is unlikely. Verse 1 continues, a man of Issachar, Ish Yisachar, man Issachar. This corresponds with the family names mentioned above from the tribe of Issachar. Issachar means he is wages. Verse 1 continues, and he dwelt in Shamir in the mountains of Ephraim. There's an emphasis in the words, Vehu Yoshev Bashamir Behar Ephraim, and he dwelling in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. The emphasis seems to be because, despite being of Issachar, Tola dwelt in a more centralized location. Shamir comes from Shamir, a thorn. For example, you can see that in Isaiah 10, 17, or a hard stone, which is found in Ezekiel 3, verse 9. It is from the same root as Shamar, to guard or keep watch. Strong sees the connection between the two as a guard is the one who would prick another like a thorn or a hard pointed stone as a defense. Thus, the name means guard, adamant, or sharp point. As seen many times, horror in the Bible, a mount, is a lot of something gathered. It is synonymous with a large but centralized group of people. Every time you see the mountain, it's always showing the same thing. Ephraim means twice fruitful, or ashes. Actually, it means both. Verse 2, he judged Israel 23 years, and he died and was buried in Shamir. Vayishpot et Yisrael esrim veshaloshana vayamat vayikavar beshamir, and judges Israel 20 and 3 year, and dies, and buried in Shamir. The word shafat to judge is used. Thus, he was a valid judge of Israel and not an usurper like his predecessor, Abimelech. Bullinger does not define the number 23. This is what we learn concerning this person, Tola. He arose, he judged, and he died. Twice fruitful. This is the work of the Lord. It is a defining mark of what he has done. He has taken away the enmity of the sword and united his people together as one. It was his afflictions that made it so, his cross, his death, and his glorious rising again. For our sakes, to the cross he did go to redeem the souls of his children. He is the one who guards Israel and watches over all the sons of men. Of his glorious work, Scripture does tell the wonderful workings of Christ for God's children. Our second thought today is the Gileadite. 
It's verses three through five. After him rose Jair a Gileadite. Vayakum Aharav Yair HaGiladi. And arises after him Jair the Gileadite. Again, it notes that this judge arose just as Tola did. Likewise, it is after Tola. Thus, there is no overlap in the times of judging Israel. He is noted as Jair. The name is derived from the word or, to be or to become light. Thus, his name means enlightener. He enlightens. He will diffuse light, one giving light, etc. The Gilead means the perpetual fountain. This person is connected to the name mentioned in Numbers 32 and Deuteronomy chapter 3 that will be looked at shortly. Of him, verse 3 continues, and he judged Israel 22 years. Vayishpot et Yisrael esrim ushtayim shana, and judges Israel 20 and 2 year. Like Tola, the wording means he is one who judges. It is a legitimate ruling of the people under the Lord. As for the duration of his time as judge, Bollinger says, 22, being the double of 11, has the significance of that number in an intensified form. Disorganization and disintegration, especially in connection with the Word of God. For the number two is associated with the second person of the Godhead, the living Word. The main thing Jair is historically remembered for is, verse 4, now he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. The words of verse 4 are unusual and they're exciting. First, to determine meaning, they will be looked at in individual clauses. Vehi lo shloshim banim rochvim al shloshim ayarim. And is to him 30 sons riding upon 30 donkeys or villages. The number 30 is defined by Bollinger. 30 being 3 times 10 denotes in a higher degree the perfection of divine order as marking the right moment. The word translated as donkey is ayir. It is a colt, a young donkey. The word comes from ur, to rouse oneself or awaken. The connection is that of raising or bearing a burden. This type of donkey pictures ruling status. This is seen in the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, speaking of the coming Messiah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding on a donkey, a colt, the ayir, the foal of a donkey. Thus, to us, the seemingly comical note of 30 sons riding upon 30 donkeys is actually equivalent to saying 30 sons who ruled. Of these sons, it next says, verse 4 continues, they also had 30 towns, ushloshim ayarim lahem, and 30 donkeys, or villages, to them. There's a play on words here. The word translated as donkey of the previous verse and the word translated as town in this verse are identical except with the later added vowel points. For fun, by transposing the thought, one could say they rode upon the cities and they ruled upon the donkeys and the meaning would become clear. This is how wordplay works. I'm riding the city. I'm in charge of it. I'm riding the donkey. I'm ruling from the donkey. Verse 4 continues, which are called Havot Jair to this day. Lahem yikreu Havot Jair ad hayom haze. To them called Havot Jair unto the day, the this. The name Havot is the plural of the word Chava, an encampment or village. That is the same as Chava, Eve, Adam's wife. It means life-giving or life as such, the village is a life-giving or living place where the bustle of life occurs. Therefore, the name Havot Jair means something like villages of the enlightener, but with the understanding that it is life-giving or livings, meaning villages of the enlightener. The surprising part of the first Jair mentioned in Numbers is in his genealogy. He is reckoned as a son of Manasseh rather than a son of Judah despite Machir's daughter having married Hezron, a grandson of Judah. This could be because Hezron was old when he married her and already had other children. He may not have wanted the son to interfere with the inheritance rights of his other children. So their son was reckoned through Manasseh. Confusion arises concerning the number of cities. In 1 Chronicles chapter 2, Jair is said to have 23 cities. However, in Deuteronomy 3, Moses says there are 60. This is often looked at as a contradiction in the Bible. 
But that is because they don't see that the term Chavot Jair is being used in both a wider and a narrower sense. In 1 Chronicles chapter 2, it says the following, Geshur and Syria took from them the towns of Jair, with Kanat and its towns, 60 towns. All these belong to the sons of Machir, the father of Gilead. What this means is that when Moses speaks of the 60 towns of Jair in Deuteronomy 3, he is referring to everything taken by both Jair and Noba. In Numbers, it is used in its stricter sense, meaning only the cities captured by Jair. The wider sense used in Deuteronomy is inclusive of what Noba took, meaning Kanat and its daughter villages. Here in Judges 10, it says that the 30 sons have 30 villages. There's no contradiction in this. The sons of Jair were given 30 of the 60 towns to rule in this area, and they were called by the name of their father within the wider sense of the term that is mentioned above. Of these cities, it next says, verse 4 continues, which are in the land of Gilead, Asher Be'eretz Hagilad, which in land the Gilead. It is the land west of the Jordan. That is the same area where the next judge, Jephthah, will exercise his time over Israel. As noted, the Gilead means the perpetual fountain. The unusual nature of the words is seen in the repetition of the word ayarim and the twice repeated lahem, which is translated as to them. I'm going to read you the whole thing and you'll see this. Vehi lo shloshim banim rochvim al shloshim. Ayarim u shloshim ayarim. Lahem, lahem yikreu chavot yair ad hayom haze asher be'eretz hagilad. And is to him 30 sons riding upon 30 donkey or villages and 30 villages, meaning donkeys, to them, to them called Havot Jair unto the day, the this, which in land the Gilead. The pun on the word donkey and village was explained. The translation of the to them, Lahem, which is often ignored by translators, should not be. Rather, the translation, as I have given it, with the parenthetical inserts, explains the meaning. It begins a new thought. It gives the idea of even to them such and so. Verse 5, And Jair died and was buried in Kamon. Vayamat Jair vayikavar be Kamon. And dies Jair and buried in Kamon. Not much was recorded of him except the note about his sons and his time of ruling but it is sufficient for him to be remembered as a judge of Israel. The name Kamon is found only here in scripture. It is derived from kum, to arise. Thus it signifies elevation, height, or arising. The Enlightener, Christ is the one. His light has shone forth for all the world. The marvelous things our Lord has done are in the word, waiting to be unfurled. He who is the judge of Israel, Christ the Lord, leads them through the ages, saving them and keeping them. So the word does tell, it is carefully revealed in his precious pages. And he is called out to the Gentiles too. The enlightener is shown forth for them as well. He is the Lord our God, faithful and true. Come, let us discover what the word does tell. Our third thought today is pictures of Christ. The words Vayakum Ahare Avimelech and arises after Abimelech necessitates that the verses we have looked at are to be considered as chronological. When a passage says something like, and it happened, it may be chronological, categorical, etc. However, the word after demands a chronological approach to what is presented. Abimelech anticipates the coming rule of the Antichrist. Everybody remember that as clear as could be. After that period, meaning during the tribulation period, the next dispensation is the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, which is prophesied in both testaments of scripture, Old Testament and New. It is the time when Israel will finally recognize who Jesus is and they will serve him. The five verses we have just analyzed anticipate that time. After Abimelech, the one to deliver Israel is Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo. Said literally, worm, son of utterance, son of his beloved. To explain the tola or worm, Psalm 22 was cited. But I am a worm, a tola, and no man. David, under inspiration and in anticipation of the coming Messiah, proclaimed that he would be called 
worm. Like the crimson grub, he is the one whose crimson blood stained the cross of Calvary. He is the son of Pua, the word of God, the utterance spoken by the creator, the son of God. He is the son of Dodo, the son of his beloved, the son of God. After that, Tola is noted as a man of Issachar, a man of he is wages. Israel will recognize that Jesus is the wages given to purchase them from the penalty of the law of Moses. It next says that Tola was dwelling in Shamir. This explains Jesus' role in the millennium. As noted, the word is from Shamir, a thorn, and that is from the same root as Shamar, to guard or keep watch. It is the exact description of the Lord as noted in Psalm 121, verse 4. He is the Shomer Yisrael, the one keeping Israel. Psalm 121, he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel, Shomer Yisrael, shall neither slumber nor sleep. He maintained them throughout their history under the law, and he will maintain them as his people through the millennium even to its completion. Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Shamir is noted as being in Mount, a gathering, Ephraim, twice fruitful, and ashes. This thought has consistently referred to Jesus being the Messiah of both the Jew and the Gentile, twice fruitful, a rite that came because of his afflictions, represented by the ashes. That then refers to those who will reign with him in the millennium. Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The resurrection involves anyone, Jew or Gentile, who refuses the mark of the beast. They will live and reign with Christ Jesus during the millennium. The reign of 23 years is noted. It is a period not defined by Bollinger and for good reason. The reign of Christ during the millennium is not fully defined by Tola. It is certain that the period of the next judge, Jair, continues the typology because his time as judge also says, Vayakum aharav Yair, and arose after him, Jair. Earthly judges die. In order to maintain the typology, the after him is provided. He is noted as Yair Hagiladi. He enlightens the perpetual fountainite. In other words, it's speaking of a person. The light is Christ. The perpetual fountain is the spirit who issues from him. Isaiah 60 provides the millennial light analogy. Here it says in Isaiah 60 verses 19 through 22, the sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you. But the Lord will be to you an everlasting light and your God, your glory. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light and the days of your mourning shall be ended. Also, your people shall all be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. It's the whole purpose for Israel being back in the land before our eyes. The entire purpose is because despite their disobedience, God is faithful to his covenants. He will never violate his covenant to that group of people. He has planted them there. They're going to go through the tribulation period. Zechariah tells us exactly the disaster that's coming. But in the end, they will reign for a thousand years with Christ the Lord. Zechariah, also referring to the millennium, provides the fountain analogy. It says in Zechariah 13, verse 1, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. 
Well, if the law was supposed to take care of sin and uncleanness, they wouldn't need that fountain, would they? But this is the steps that Israel must take in order to be brought to the Lord. As uh, Paul says in Galatians, the law is what? A tutor to lead us to Christ. It's an instructor. That's why we have instructors is to teach us something and lead us somewhere. The law was that tutor. Of Jair's rule, it is 22 years. As noted by Bollinger, it is an intensified form of 11. Disintegration, disorganization, and disintegration, especially in connection with the Word of God. Two is associated with the second person of the Godhead, the living Word. The millennium is certainly associated with Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, but a time of heightened disorganization and disintegration? That seems like it's contradictory to the millennium, doesn't it? But it isn't. There are numerous verses that indicate such a state. Despite being a time of Christ's rule, there will astonishingly be those who rebel against it, both within the land and outside of it. Those within the land, Isaiah 65, verse 20. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner, being 100 years old, shall be accursed. And then outside the land of Israel, and it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. Why tabernacles? Why? Because it pictures Christ dwelling in his humanity. They are there to worship the king sitting on his throne, the incarnate word of God. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. However, because these two judges reflect the time of the millennium, it would seem appropriate to combine the two times of judgeships into one, meaning 45 years. It is a derivative of nine and five. Nine signifies finality or judgment. Finality is an exacting mark of the millennium, the final dispensation of the 7,000 year span of man on earth. It is the time when judgment on sin is finally complete in mankind. However, the millennium itself is stamped with the marvelous number five, grace. Of Jair, it said that he had 30 sons riding upon 30 donkeys. 30 is, according to Bollinger, in a higher degree, the perfection of divine order as marking the right moment. It is the right moment for the final dispensation to be realized. Christ's work is complete. The nation has come to him. Those of the tribulation, both Jew and Gentile, are raised to rule, pictured by the sons on donkeys. And finally, harmony is realized in the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The rule of these sons is said to be in Havot Jair, life-giving of the Enlightener. An exact description of this is found during the promised millennial reign in Revelation chapter 20. Blessed and holy is he who has his part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. These words were then said to be in the land of the Gilead, the perpetual fountain. Just as Christ is the perpetual fountainite, so his people will dwell in the fellowship of the eternal spirit of God, the perpetual fountain. It says in Isaiah 32, verse 15, until the spirit is poured upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field and the fruitful field is counted as a forest. That prophecy refers to the time after the exile of Israel in the latter days, just as the typology here anticipates. It is during this time frame that Jair was said to be buried in Hamon. As noted, the name is derived from Qum, to arise. Isaiah also prophesied of that for the redeemed of the Lord. Arise, come, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. 
The old adage, the devil is in the details, doesn't quite explain the matter when it comes to scripture. Rather, we can boldly proclaim Christ is in the contents. These five verses, seemingly sparse in their contents, tell us about two of the judges of Israel. And yet they contain a marvelous tapestry of what is ahead for us in the stream of redemptive history. At the beginning of the sermon, I mentioned the commentary on these verses from the NIV Life Application Study Bible that mom gave me. Their comments were not very deep, nor did they comprise everything that they claimed was in these verses. And yet, I have remembered their brief words since the first and only time that I read them well over 20 years ago. This is because what they asked is actually quite important. What are you doing for God that's worth noting? When your life is over, will people remember you more than just what was in your bank account or the number of years you lived? We, like the stories that we have been evaluating from the book of Judges, are on a trip through history. Our lives are much shorter than it seemed when we were young. As we age, we realize that more and more. My granddaughter was born just three months and one day before I typed this sermon. But what really caught me off guard is that my little baby, my tangerine, is now 37 years old. Shh, please don't tell anyone I said so. It was only yesterday that I held her in my arms for the first time and looked in her precious face. My son isn't far behind. The little boy is now a man. And yes, both of them have couple of gray hairs. <laughs> Our lives are, as Moses says in Psalm 90, like grass. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up, and in the evening, it is cut down and withers. Listen, I graduated high school yesterday. I'm going to be 60 years old this year, okay? Your life is way shorter than you actually are thinking. What is it that you are doing for the cause of the Lord Jesus? Before you know it, your years will end, and the time set to stand before him will have arrived. The thought that goes through my mind daily, I say this every single day, use me up now, Lord. I was telling somebody just a while ago, the last day that I took off, the last day was September 28th of 2020. I don't want time off. I don't want breaks. I want to keep working until the Lord takes me home. I want to use this body up for him. We all have a job to do. What are you going to do with it? Let the Lord and his coming kingdom be the constant thought on your mind. Be filled with the desire to be a part of what he is doing now. The days are coming to their fulfillment, and what is left undone will not be called back for a second chance. Read the word, let it fill your mind, and then let the knowledge you glean from it be what directs your feet each moment of each day. To the glory of God who placed you here at this moment in time. May it be so. Wonderful. I'm telling you, none of this was known to me. I've never read a single commentary on anything that we have brought up in typology from Judges chapter 1 through this chapter right here. There are typological hints that people give, and they're usually wrong. They're just taking things and pulling them out willy-nilly. But God is showing us a detailed record of what he is going to do all through redemptive history, right in the pages of these books. Joshua did it. Judges is doing it. We got all kinds of great things coming up. Jephthah, he had to sacrifice his daughter. That's coming up very soon. What do you think that pictures? That story doesn't need to be in the Bible. It's depressing. You think, what is the Lord telling us by putting that into his, unless it's telling us of something else, unless he's typologically giving us information to tell us that he is in control of this world. And I got to tell you what, if we didn't have this I would still believe this, at least what it says, because of the nation of Israel. I'm saying if we didn't have this readily available, if I knew what it said, even if I didn't have a chance to read it every day, I didn't mean if we don't have this, but if we just don't have it. I'm a guy that's in a Catholic church 400 years ago, and I hear it read once in a while, and I say, but they're there. They're there. That's his people. They're there. They're there. They're there. They're there. I mean, look at what John Gill said. Look at what Adam Clark said. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Israel was reestablished, there were a few people out there that said they will be a nation again. And the rest of the church laughed at him. Oh, no, they're out. We've replaced Israel. And then they were vindicated. And everybody got puckered up and said, oh, 
We're going to have to change our theology, but most of them don't. And they keep rejecting the obvious that's right in front of their faces. Believe the word. Look at it, and when you read it, think, what is this telling me? It's going to point to God's Messiah. There is no doubt about that. If God is going to send his Messiah into the world, and there is a story in here that makes absolutely no sense, then think, Lord, how does this point to Jesus? And the answer will come out. That has been vindicated again and again since Genesis 1-1, and it will continue to be so. I may not be able to figure it out, but it is there. The answer is in this word because he wants us to have that personal relationship with him. If you have never called on Jesus Christ, if you've never accepted God's payment for the punishment under the law. Now, I'm not just talking about the law of Moses. I mean, Adam had one law. It was in the negative. Don't do this one thing. And what did he and Eve do? They ran over there and did it right in front of him as quick as they could. I mean, that's Charlie Garrett paraphrase, but they did it. One thing. They've got all of Eden in front of them. One thing you're not to do, and they did it. And it says, because of that act, death entered the world. And that death spread to all men because all sinned. All of us have inherited what Adam did. We can't get out of it. Even if I sin today, I can't go back and undo what I did. And I certainly can't go back and undo what Adam did. I'm in the stream of time, and I am going in this direction. Right? What am I going to do about that? Where am I going to get rid of that sin debt? It's not from the blood of bulls and goats. We're told that explicitly, not only in the book of Hebrews, but elsewhere in the Old Testament. We were talking about Leviticus chapter 10 and the deaths of two of Aaron's sons today. What is that picturing? Already at the very inception of the law of Moses, it was telling us that this law cannot take away the sin debt. It's impossible. Somebody greater must come and do it for us. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Please call on him. He will restore you. If, you. if you have doubts in your heart about this, just ask God, if this could be true, would you please reveal it to me? Do you think that God is going to turn away a request like that if you're truly sincere? But I'll tell you something. If you're not sincere, he's not going to show you anything. But if you really want to know, if this message is true, God, please reveal it to me. I I'm certain he will. Then maybe he's done it to you today, the people online, somebody watching this and says, I just don't know. Listen, I didn't make any of this up. I just take information and I mechanically analyze it. And then I think, Lord, how does this fit in with the rest of scripture? This Monday, I was typing my sermon and I got myself sick from overworking. Is it true? I was literally sick from overworking. All Tuesday, I could hardly move. And it was worth it to me. I could make up a sermon in 30 minutes and I could present it to you and you wouldn't know any different. You'd say, oh, it's a good sermon. Thank you, Charlie. See you later. Wouldn't make any difference. I'm not going to do that to you. I'm going to get you what I can. And if it takes me 15 hours of hard work and getting myself physically sick, I will do it because I love this word and I love what God has put into it for us. Read the word and think about it. I've got a closing verse for you from Psalm 90, verse 12. This is Moses, the oldest psalm in the Bible. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Shouldn't we ask for wisdom? Yes. James Yaakov, he says, if you just ask for it, the Lord will provide it. Just ask for it. <laughs> Next week is Judges 10, 6 through 18. The voice of the people sounds quite chagrined. It's entitled, We Have Sinned. That'll be our 32nd Judges Sermon. It's setting up, that sermon next week is setting up everything that we're going to see through Jephthah and after that as well. It's rather incredible. The Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. It is he who judges his people according to their deeds. So follow him, live for him, and trust him. And he will do marvelous things for you and through you. Okay? Now I know it's only... 12.04, I'm usually saying amen at 12.30 or something. Three things happened today. The music stopped a little early, Jim was very short, and the Prophecy Update was exactly the same length as it always is. Exactly. I do the same pages. But this sermon was shorter than the others. Okay? So, I apologize. I know some people will email me and say, church ended too early. 
I, I, I'm not kidding. They're like my friend Becky out in Colorado says, you're, clo- you're so early lately. Well, it's either Jim's fault or it's your fault for the music. <laughs> or maybe my fault with the short sermon. But, you know, I only got five, five verses to work with. But five verses. Look at what's in there. And I know I gave you some tedious information about the history of Jair and the, the cities. There was a reason for that. It's because later you're going to have somebody say, well, this is contradictory to here, and your faith is going to be shaken. There's no contradiction. You just have to analyze the entire Bible and say, I got this, I got this. What are you telling us? There it is. Moses isn't making an error in one book to the next. He's telling us something that we need to know. And he's doing it for typological reasons as well. I mean, that's the great thing. God is giving you a literal historical account actually happened in history. He's giving us prophecy within that account normally. He's also giving you a moral lesson. The entire Bible is filled with moral lessons. Don't do this, do this. We can make those kind of sermons all day long, like the guy at the beginning of this. Here's a moral lesson, right? It was good. I remembered it all these years. But he's doing one more thing. He's doing four things. The fourth one is typology. He's telling us information. Why waste words? This is God. He can write DNA code that we can't even get close to matching today. If he can write DNA, he can give us this word that is beyond our ability to fully grasp. I mean, what's in there? Chiasms and parallelisms and uh, so many literary structures. It goes on and on and on. And some of them people have not found until the past one or 200 years. Some of them, they're still finding chiasms to this day. I got one in a coming sermon that I found just a week ago or I'm sorry, whenever I typed it, 10 weeks ago, okay? They're right there, but people don't see them, and all of a sudden, out they come. God is giving us information. The Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. It is he who judges his people according to their deeds. So follow him, live for him, and trust him, and he will do marvelous things for you and through you, okay? I know we all like the for you stuff. Oh, God's gonna do great things for me. What about through you? How is he going to use you for somebody else? Very short poem, and we'll take the Lord's Supper. Oh, wait a minute. I got a question. Let's see. What am I going to give you? I'll give you another one of these this week. Um, Okay. Let's see. This is from our supplier. I won't say where he is or who he is, but he sends these. Oh, yeah. This is another one. This is kind of like last week's. It's already got the thing in there. Once again, this is uh, not this is fired, but it's not um, porcelain glazed. So, if you get this, put it on a plate because if not, eventually, eventually it'll weep through. Okay, but this is uh, got a little cute stamp on there. Is this one in, from China or from Israel? Because last week was Israel. This one is from. Uh, it doesn't say biblical oil lamp. Doesn't say last week it said from is. Oh wait a minute, it's got a little certificate in here. Certificate of authority or uh, authenticity. Um, Biblical oil lamp, uh, uh, archaeological digs in the Holy Land, Matthew, whatever. And it's, oh yeah, the Jerusalem gift shop. So this is from Israel. And you got a certificate of authority this week. Okay, got to get this question. This came out of the easy file, so you got to raise your hand. Okay, if you get this, raise your hand. This is really easy too, but um, I'm going to put it right here. All right, get ready. Where was Jacob... When he dreamt of a ladder going up to heaven. Bethel. Bethel. Also known as? I'll give you a bonus point if you can guess what the other name. Anybody know? Lutz. Lutz. That's right. L-U-Z. Okay. But no, no, no second lamp. That was, just a, that was just an add-on. Okay. There you go. You got yourself a lamp. Did you win last week? You're on a roll. Oh, wait. You can give it to someone else. No, 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 no. You can give it to somebody else. Or you can have two in your house. I mean, I used to have two of them going all the time. I don't know what I did with them. But anyway, yeah, light three of them. Next week, you might get a third. Enjoy them. All you need is olive oil. You just pour in olive oil and get the cheap stuff. No point in, you know, wasting. The good stuff is for the tabernacle, okay? So I get the cheap stuff, put it in there, and it'll burn all night long. It's great stuff. Okay, here we go. Congratulations. She's reading and remembering her Bible. Okay, um, Tola and Jair, judges of Israel. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel. Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a funny name, it would seem, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamar in the mountains of Ephraim. He judged Israel 23 years, just short of another leap year, and he died and was buried in Shamir. 
After him, Jair, a Gileadite, arose among his peers, and he judged Israel 22 years. Now, he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. They also had 30 towns, not too bad, which are called Havot Jair to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Kamon, and into the ground he was sown. Lord God, turn our hearts to be obedient to your word. Give us wisdom to be ever faithful to you. May we carefully heed each thing we have heard. Yes, Lord God, may our hearts be faithful and true. And we shall be content and satisfied in you alone. We will follow you as we sing our songs of praise. Hallelujah to you, to us your path you have shown. Hallelujah. We shall sing to you for all of our days. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the stories in Judges. Wow. Talk about a vindication of typology leading to proper understanding of theology. Dispensationalism, it's right there. The idea that Israel is not out, that it has not been replaced by the church, it's right there. We could go through doctrine after doctrine after doctrine that the typology clears up. Lord God, you've done it so that we who are not so smart in our heads can actually learn things by confirming it from your word. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful, precious gift of God that has been brought down to us through the ages and finally delivered to us in a way that we can see these types and patterns. How wonderful it is, Lord God, to be the recipients of your favor and this precious word that you've given us. Thank you for it, and we praise you for it, and we do so in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Okay, before the sermon, I had this really great comment I was going to tell you when I did this, and I can't remember what it was. So, sorry about that. We get the instruction for the Lord's Supper comes directly from Scripture. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul, the rabbi Shaul, okay, was a Pharisee of the people of Israel, and he became Paul after his first convert, Sergius Paulus. I guess he changed his name and said, I'm going, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. I'm going to identify with the Gentiles. And so he took on a, a Greek name, Paul. And that's where we know him from. But he said, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and he gave thanks over it. He would have blessed it first. He would have said these words, Baruch ata Adonai Loheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, Christ out of the grave. And he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he would have blessed that as well. He would have said, Baruch ata Adonai Loheinu, Melech haolam, Borei Peri Hagafen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. with a note of explanation attached, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. It says in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, mm -hmm. we'll just say in that area because it's more than one verse. He says, behold, I make, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Okay, a new covenant. If he's making a new covenant, why would he do that if the old covenant sufficed? Why would he do that? But the prophet Jeremiah said this, and he said it to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, okay? God graciously included the Gentiles in the new covenant. 
And that is actually seen in the book of Isaiah. Behold, I make you a light to the nations, etc. But this covenant stands because of his faithfulness to Israel. And someday they will be faithful to him again as a nation, and they will be brought into this new covenant that was promised to them. And the nations will serve under the Lord. That's all seen in our verses today. The wonderful workings of God in Christ because of his faithfulness to his covenants. Thank God for Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to say it now because you said they're watching. Hi. Just like, <laughs> yeah, your mom and dad are so cool. Um, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And it's good to have you back. Oh, yeah. Another month or so, enjoy her presence because she's going to be off. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. I know. We don't want her to go. We need to keep the congregation young. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Amen. You thought I never read that study Bible you gave me, didn't you? <laughs> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. So glad you're here. I heard you talking when you first came in about things, so I'm very happy. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Oh, am I? I'm I like, coming here. Oh, boy, I like that pen. I'm going to, I'm missing that right now. I can't wait to win. I can't wait. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Oh, one thing. I don't want to forget this. Um, we have a surgery coming up on Tuesday for somebody. Please keep him in prayer. Um, I don't want to, I, I, I get sidetracked, okay? And when I get sidetracked, I forget to say things. And so I don't want to do that. We'll start to close and something will happen and I'll forget. Please pray for his knee. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Lord Jesus. <laughs> and I was hanging around. Oh, it's, I, it's such a word. It's just unbelievable. Today was amazing. Thank you. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Oh, I don't think I'm going to see you again before you leave. Come here and give me a big hug. It's so good to finally meet you. You tell your wife and children I said hi. All right. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Thank you. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. It does that pretty good. They are. This is tasty. I, you know, I thought last week we had, what, four people in the church, and so I brought yeah, out no. two, and I ended up putting one back. So oh, now I brought out one, and it's, it's not big enough. Way. I had to make it really small. So whatever. Mm. Uh, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Charlie. No, thank you. Thank you. Okay. The um, ambassador from Israel quoted this, and this is what I hope motivated the book Smart Rabbi and said, I'll have to check it out. He stole the, the spear and the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like called him across the river. He could have killed him. Oh, yeah, abso absolutely. That's very good. Yeah, however, they're open to hearing uh, Jesus. Boy, let's hope so. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Did he give you something yet? He's got something for you. Yes. He okay. Did. Good. Thank you very good. much. Good. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And the next recipient will appreciate that. I hear you. I hear you. Good stuff. Very wonderful to meet you, sir. You're Dave, right? I'm Dave. Oh, you're Dave. Okay. Wonderful to have you here. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. You're Kenny Senior, right? Yep. Okay. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Oh, thank you. Kenny Jr., yes. the body yes, and the sir. blood of the Lord Jesus. Yes, All right. You, I see your daughters have to leave. You tell them we said hi, okay? Yeah. All right. They wanted to go shopping. I store, understand but... that. I get that. Yeah. All right. I better let them sit. They got lots of gabbing going on. That is Sergio's friend, and then the other guys are Roy's family. 
So, Simeon is his name. They're Boston. They're in Boston. He and his wife are both doctors up there. Here's one more for you. Oh, good. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, it's so good to have the visitors here today. Thank you for making the effort, and I hope you'll have a good and safe time while you're here. And uh, travel safely when you leave. Uh, we got some uh, prayer requests done, prayer requests uh, just noted. Please pray for these people. Um, I hope everybody here will be safe, happy, and content in the Lord Jesus today and throughout the week. And um, uh, get ready. We got another question coming next week. And do we have anything? Yes, I got one more oil lamp. So we got uh, uh, that's an old tambourine. I got one more oil lamp. So that'll be next week. And I got other things at the house to pan out. So keep studying. You're bound to get something here. Um, Heavenly Father, how grateful we are to you for what you have done for us in the giving of your son for our sins. Lord, that had to be dealt with first, and once that was taken care of, glory lies ahead. And Lord, we can be absolutely certain in our hearts and in our souls and in our minds that the word is true, and therefore the promises are true. And we have no need to worry when our days come to an end that we will stand before you someday and be glorified because of the beautiful vision that we see and will continue to see for all eternity the glory of God radiating through the person of our Lord Jesus. May that day be so. And we pray this in his beautiful name. Amen. Amen.